Very warm welcome viewers in the program Halat e Hazra with Dr. Tahir. Professor, uh, United States and the European Union, they imposed uh, very strict sanctions uh, on uh, Russia. But when we see that, uh, for example, uh, India, he's, he's buying oil and um, uh, the export and import where the trade with you can say that Russia is continue there's no any any sanctions on India but other countries uh, uh, the underdeveloped country like Pakistan and African countries uh, they can't do anything with uh, any deal with Russia and they cannot buy even the the cheap oil uh, from Russia and grains and food and so many things here so my question is that the United States uh, is a trillion of dollars economy. Even UK is a trillion of dollar economy. European Union is a very big, very huge economy. But the underdeveloped country like Pakistan, like Afghanistan, like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and the other countries of the African countries, uh, they cannot survive. America can survive because the trillion dollars of economy, the European Union, the United Kingdom, so what the how these small countries and weakest countries, economically weak countries, how they can survive here yeah, because of the sanctions on Russia and while the India is buying oil and this the trade is still continue no sanctions no ban on that right now. and european union even and the united kingdom and united states they are not taking any any restrictions and actions on india's so why because this is uh, the more than one billions of people's in the country and uh, very very big uh, trade links with Europe and the United Kingdom and USA, but very strict sanctions on the smallest country. So why this is happening here and how the smallest country and the weak, economically weak country can survive in this uh, difficult time? Yes, okay, well there's, there's a couple of things there um, that are very significant. So one is the, um, the broader global uh, implications that we talked about, particularly in um, developing countries. And then there's a specific question about about India, which, yes. which I'll come on to, because India is in a, a very interesting case in a way. So, so what the the, the global implications? Uh, Realisation is starting to come through now. I think that the um, the implications of this crisis on global food supply and and the impact on on very weak economies is is really significant and, and is is much greater than anyone had anticipated. And that the the potential for um, significant um, unrest, for economic hardship, for even possibly famine in parts of the world, is starting to become very apparent. And it's incumbent upon the the powerful nations of the world to to address that as much as they address the particular strategic military crisis in Ukraine. So I think the. Um, the good news is it's difficult to say that any of the news at the moment is good, but I think the good news is that awareness about the significance of that is starting to um, come through now. And that, that there's recognition that actually there are two strategies that are needed. On, on the specific point about sanctions, sanctions are a very blunt instrument. Um, they, they're one of those tools that um, many countries reach for in these situations when they don't want to get involved militarily. Um, they, they sometimes hit the target, but they also sometimes hit lots of other targets, including your own economy, of course. You know, the, the imposition of sanctions by the West on, on Russia has affects Western economies to a certain degree as well as, as, as the Russian economy. Um, so, so this is why it's, it's um, getting agreement on sanctions measures is quite complicated and can sometimes be resisted by certain countries. Um, so I think the, the there are two strategies that are needed here. One is a, a military strategy to, to bring this conflict to an end. So that's why the NATO summit today is very, very significant and why NATO really needs to think about what its strategy should be henceforth um, to to bring this conflict to some sort of resolution. Of course, the, the ways to do that are not absolutely clear at the moment, but um, the longer this goes on, the worse the impacts might be on the global economy. So that's the first thing. I think there's, there's growing recognition that 
um, some sort of a, emergency uh, food assistance is going to be needed in parts of the world. Um, there, there is a great deal of, of money, billions of dollars already going into um, preparing um, food assistance to certain countries that, that might fall into particularly grave situations. Um, so that's going to be a major part of the strategy as well. It's not, it's not necessarily going to solve the structural problems, but might be able to alleviate immediate problems in certain countries. None of this is, is particularly uplifting. These are very, very challenging um, situations that we had before us. And the, the powerful countries will have to reach into their pockets to try and um, alleviate the effects, the effects of this in, in, the, in the poorer parts of the world. Now, India is interesting now, because what we're seeing across the world, particularly outside of the West, is a, a very complex shifting set of interests and alliances and alignments. Yeah. And in a curious way, this is as much about China as it is about yeah, Russia. Yeah, that's my question. So, yeah. Yeah. so in many parts of the world, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, the, the implications of the Russia conflict are what happens with China or what, what hap happens in terms of how, how, what China is going to do in the region. What, because China, remember, is the other big preeminent um, anti-liberal force in the world that's on the march alongside Russia and trying to create a, a different world order, a new world order. Now, big, uh, India is a very significant country for lots of reasons because it's it's big, it's a, it's a dynamically emerging economy, it um, tends to, it, it has aspirations to be a leading diplomatic power. It's very interested in um, United Nations reform in terms of governance of the United Nations, in the expansion of permanent members on the Security Council. It sees an opportunity here, potentially, to carve out a, a role for itself on the world stage. And um, lots of big powers are, are essentially courting India effectively to, to make sure that India is on their side. Because of uh, the big economic part, in India, it's, it's, that's why it's they potentially have huge economic, economic, power. economic interest yeah. of the world with India. So that's why it's a, uh, uh, they're just uh, uh, giving some relaxation uh, to India because of uh, China and yes. uh, uh, because India is the United States ally against China. So that's why exactly. in the region yeah. that one here. So yes. this is the reason or the economic reason. Well. It's, it's economic and political. So, so India is potentially a big economic and political counterbalance to China in in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah. Um, just partly because of its sheer size and the fact that it is nominally a democracy rather than an authoritarian country. Although um, the the Modi leadership at the moment is showing some dangerous signs of um, being rather authoritarian. But that's a, that's another discussion for another day. Um, so. So the West wants to keep India in its camp, essentially, and we hmm. know that as a counterbalance to, to, to China, China um, or indeed Russia, because of it, India has long historical links with Le Russia yeah. and the Soviet Union. Um, so we know in, in the um, defence sphere, for example, we know India is one of the quadrilateral partners alongside the US, Australia and Japan, uh, a defensive alliance in that region. That, that helps to bring India inside the the Western tent, if you like. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's India knows that it has a lot of influence here, that it has political and economic influence, and it has aspirations to become a a, a growing power, both politically and economically and diplomatically, on the world stage. And to be a different power, not not a power that aligns itself to either east or west, but a a power in a more multilateral world, perhaps, where there are different emerging powers. So India is playing quite a complex game at the moment and keeping lots of options open, making sure it doesn't too comprehensively align itself with one mm. side or another. The big powers are perhaps prepared to um, excuse certain things in India's case because they don't want to drive them away into into opposing camps. So there's very complex, as we remember Lord Palmerston in the in the Victorian era said, yeah. um, countries don't have friends, they, they only have interests, you know, and I, and I think in some ways we're 
the way that India is behaving and the way that other powers are behaving towards India at the moment is a classic example of, of complex state interests that mean that, that certain ideological alignments might be overlooked in favour of political and economic... Can I conclude uh, from your this, uh, uh, discussion that uh, India is, uh, is a major ally of uh, Europe and America in the region, economically and politically? Uh, yes, I mean we 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 feel we they're in our camp. <laughs> if if mm. I can say we, thinking yes. with a Western hat on, um, we have of course we in the UK have have particular historic links with India that we feel are important. That that um, we're like-minded on on many issues. There's huge economic potential for us in in being part of the growing Indian economic story. Um, so yes, we, we naturally feel they, they should fall into our camp, but of course India doesn't necessarily want to comprehensively fall into anyone's camp at the moment. They want to, to strike their own path. They, they, don't want to be, um, they don't want to be sucked into one side or another necessarily to the detriment of their, their future interests. They know that although they're a rival power to China, for example, they know that um, China is a, is a force that can't be ignored, really. That's, that's the case for lots of powers in the Asia-Pacific region. They have to think how they can potentially work with China um, and not alienate them too much because you can't, you can't ignore the, the rising political and economic power that is China. So, so India is playing a clever game, I think, at the moment. It, it knows it has a lot of cards to play. Um, it knows it has a, has a bright future, essentially, on the international stage and it's, um, it's trying to you could, if we were being pest, um, negative, we could say it's, it's playing off everyone against yeah. everyone else. Now, uh, Professor, can I ask you that uh, uh, how this war, what in Ukraine, how this war will affect the countries outside of Europe? Well, I think these there are economic there are e economic effects that we've discussed to a certain yeah. extent already. The um, the, the, the sheer disruption of the global economy is, is going to have very severe effects in, in parts of the world outside of Europe. As you rightly said, US, Europe have a certain degree of resilience that they can ride this storm out to a certain degree, but other parts of the world won't be able to so much. So that's very significant. But politically, and, and we talked a little bit about this last time, that the notions of East and West and alignments and non-alignments are shifting quite interestingly at the moment. Um, a lot of um, countries outside of the West uh, don't necessarily want to be in either a Western or an Eastern camp. Um, they, they want to perhaps be part of a, a more dynamic um, multipolar world. This is partly India's calculation yeah. that the, the, the power might be shifting away from the, the traditional elitist small group on the, on the Security Council of the UN to maybe a more diverse and expanded group of powers that um, more, perhaps more properly reflect the, the complex um, nature of the world really. So, so a lot of countries are uh, thinking about uh, what sort of group they want to fall into. If you look at places like um, Africa, for example, the Chinese economic influence is very, very significant in many African countries. Hmm. Huge amounts of Chinese infrastructural development going in. Um, a lot of African countries don't necessarily agree with the authoritarian political model that China has and don't necessarily want to make themselves too dependent on China. But at the same time, they, um, they want to be able to develop and attract infrastructural investment. So, so why not? You know, so, so I think there's, we're seeing quite significant shifts in power alignments, perhaps a shift away from a bipolar East versus West world. To so can I say world. that uh, uh, politically and economically, this war will affect m more severely uh, the countries out of Europe? Because... Uh, Europe and the United Kingdom, as uh, I discussed before, that and uh, you told that uh, the multi uh, economy and they can survive it. But the weakest country, they cannot survive, especially in this high inflation. And uh, I'm just if I talk about Pakistan, this uh, uh, 20 plus 
uh, inflation rate in Pakistan. That's yeah. very high, and uh, even in the United Kingdom, but they can afford. But African countries, so and uh, especially uh, the all wealthy countries, uh, they put their focused only uh, in, uh, in in this war, and uh, they abandoned other countries. Uh, especially in Africa, in, uh, in Eastern countries, the South Asia and countries. So politically and economically, this war mm, severely affected uh, uh, the country outside of Europe. Is it right? Yes. Um, I, think, I think you're right that m many of the effects will be felt more severely outside of Europe. Um, and you're also right that Europe may have a tendency to just concentrate on on the, the military situation to the detriment of thinking about the rest of the world, which is why these um, the UN's efforts to emphasise the growing food crisis are very, very important, that, that we have to understand that. I think in another way it might be different from years gone by in that the world is a much more interconnected place now than it used to be. The, the, the global economy is much more interconnected than it used to be. So um, severe difficulties in, in other parts of the world have a bigger potential to affect us all, even, even in Europe, I think. We, we can no longer be fortress Europe and, and not care or have any connection to other parts of the world. All of this, of course, as we said earlier, adds up to the need to find solutions to bring this conflict to an end. Um, the longer this goes on, the more severe the disruption will be and the more severely it will be fe felt in some parts of the world. Um, so, so in many ways this, this shift from uh, the initial phase to a, a, a much more serious phase potentially where the, the implications of this, it's starting to be realised that the implications of this are, are potentially much more serious than we initially thought. Um, this, this means we have to find solutions to this um, and, and they may be they may be messy and bloody solutions in the short term but um, one of the points that the, the British Prime Minister actually made um, today I think um, I don't agree with the British Prime Minister on everything but <laughs> yeah. he, he very presently said um, the Second World War was, was a very obviously a, a very very traumatic episode for all parts of the world to a certain extent, particularly for Europe obviously, but for yeah. all parts of the world. It led to a um, severe economic effects for many, many years afterwards. But one thing it did was usher in a period of peace and stability hmm. um, that we enjoyed really up until recently. So the, the defeat of Nazism led to a, a relatively peaceful stable world with um, uh, the, the possibility for democracy and and, and um, liberal ideals I guess so so that's why some allusions are being made to the 1930s again at the moment that that um, we all hope not but maybe we have to start considering some comprehensive military solution to this that will allow us to to move on again into a more peaceful and stable world hereafter. Uh, can I ask you what are the prospects of peace uh, in this war? Uh, very slim at the moment, <laughs> very, it's virtually non-existent. Um, the Russians say every day virtually that if the Ukrainians lay down their arms, this, it's all over, well, they'll stop and, and that'll be the end of it. Of course the Ukrainians are absolutely in no mood to do that at the moment because they feel that would be a, a massive tactical error. Um, the, the battle lines have been drawn. I think the, a, f a few weeks ago there were attempts at talks. We know that the Ukrainian and Russian delegations actually met and had talks of sorts in, in neighbouring countries. That's pretty much all stopped now. The, the Russian position has entrenched. Um, they seem to be showing absolutely no um, movement at all in their position diplomatically. So I think one would have to say the, the, the immediate prospects for peace are, are virtually non-existent. Um, the diplomats will of course be working furiously to try and create some sort of environment where some discussions could be had, but um, I'm afraid to say we're, we're not at that stage at the moment, and in fact we're, we're further away from that than we were a few weeks ago. So uh, um, the diplomacy of uh, 
of Europe, uh, you can say that, that it has failed, and because every country there, they try to just settle down this issue, this conflict, but not yet. Yes, so the diplomacy not resulted at the moment. No, and and for the West particularly, and for NATO, this this has actually hardened our position and united NATO more in a defensive posture. Um, the decision of Finland and Sweden that we mentioned earlier to join the NATO bloc, um, that's very significant. Um, that shows that countries that were previously very much believers in neutrality and diplomatic solutions to things have, have, have thrown that idea out of the window now and that they're joining a, a military defensive alliance. Um, <clears throat> so, so yes, I, I think unfortunately for all of us, of course, the any attempts at diplomacy or negotiation are, are, are fading with every day. And of course every um, really offensive military action that Russia takes on the ground just further deepens that resolve to, to move to a more military solution than a diplomatic solution. Um, so, you know, for those of us who, all of us of course, um, don't want to see conflict happening um, the world's moving in the wrong direction at the moment, I think, unfortunately. Uh, Professor, my last question is very much straightforward. Uh, please, can I ask you that, uh, is Russia winning or losing? <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's losing. It's been losing right from the start. I, th I think it was a massive miscalculation by President Putin. Hmm. I think Lots of things that he didn't want to happen are now happening as a result of his actions. I think the hardening of resolve in NATO, um, you know, a few months ago, the, the notion that Finland, Sweden, Ukraine, um, Georgia, Moldova, the, the idea that they would join NATO was yeah. pre pretty much way off the table. You know, there was no intention for that to happen. Um, or that some of those countries would join the EU, for example, that Ukraine is now on an accelerated pathway to join the EU. So all, all of the things that Putin didn't want to happen strategically are now happening as a result of his actions. And, and militarily, he may be making some gains on the ground in eastern Ukraine at the moment. He's con they're consolidating their position there. Um, they're taking over some of the key strategic cities. They're digging in. So, so tactically, they might be able to say that they're, they're doing better at the moment than they were a few weeks ago. But in the longer view, the strategically, Russia is becoming more and more isolated politically and economically. The sanctions will, if they go on for long enough, will bring Russia down eventually and, and the economy will collapse. So um, I, I've said it all along, this is a, a huge mistake by Russia and I think it remains a massive mistake and I think they will um, they will rue the day that they invaded Ukraine. Professor, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion and goodbye views. Thank you Mohammed.